Hello, good evening and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Today is episode 2 of Polity this week. But today we shall be discussing polity based current affairs of the past two weeks of the period 14th January to 27th January because for some reason I was not available last Saturday. These are the topics that we shall be discussing today, covering sources such as Hindustan Times, the Indian Express, the Hindu Economic and Political Weekly, and watch out for this section, watch out. So let's get started and look at column one, a call to treat India's prisoners fairly and humanly, written by Gopal Krishna Gandhi, the grandson of the Mahatma, a former IAS officer, he was also High Commissioner of India to South Africa. He was also the Governor of the State of West Bengal. Now what is the issue? There are close to 5.5 lakh prisoners in India in different jails, central jails, state jails, in different jails of this country. But majority of them, more than 4 lakh of them are under trials. They have not yet been convicted by the court. They have not yet been declared guilty. These are under trials. A significant judgment was given by the Madurai branch or the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court. The case was People's Watch versus Home Secretary of the State of Tamil Nadu. Now what Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi is writing he is talking about something very important. He says, look at these under trials. Don't call them people that they are just like us or they are amongst us or they are like us. He was alluding to a statement made by Jessida Ardern, who is now resigned as the Prime Minister of New Zealand. When a bomber or when a militant attacked the worshippers at a mosque in Christchurch in New Zealand, she referred to the people who were the victims by saying that they are not like us or amongst us. She said that these are us. The people who have been attacked, they are us. Similarly, Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi is saying that the prisoners or the under trials who are there in lakhs of numbers in different jails of this country, they are us. Because we can also be one amongst them. Because we can also be committing crimes and be thrown into different jails of this country. But they deserve to be treated fairly. They deserve to be treated humanly. In this judgment, the Madras High Court said something important. The Madras High Court said that there should be a body of people, technical people, non-official group of visitors, or non-official technical experts, should be constituted into a group, a body, and they should be visiting the jails to check whether the prisoners are treated fairly or not, to address some of the genuine concerns and the grievances of the prisoners, because they deserve to be treated with respect. Madras High Court also said that we should also be calling upon this board of visitors to recommend some measures by which we can reduce the overcrowding of jails. Because there are jails in this country which are overflowing, overcrowded. If the capacity is one, there are two members, two prisoners in the jails. And the worst performing states are such as Uttar Pradesh, states such as Maharashtra. They are performing spectacularly bad when it comes to the crowding of jails. So what Madras High Court is saying, number one, these prisoners should be treated with respect. Number two, a board of visitors, non-official technical board of visitors should be set up so that this board can visit different jails in Tamil Nadu and address some of the genuine problems and grievances of the prisoners. And at the same time, this board may also recommend to the government measures by which we can reduce the overcrowding of jails. And at the same time, something significant. Madras High Court said that the Tamil Nadu state should amend some prison rules, prison norms, because prison is a state subject under the distribution of powers. Under 7th schedule of the constitution, prison is a state subject. So Madras High Court is asking the Tamil Nadu government to reform, amend, modify your prison rules 
and amend them according to Nelson Mandela rules. And this is where Madras High Court also quoted a statement of Nelson Mandela, wherein he had said, No one truly knows a nation unless one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. These rules were previously known as United Nations Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners. But in the year 2015, these rules were renamed in the name of Nelson Mandela because he spent 27 years in prison in South Africa because he was fighting apartheid. These rules, they talk about that prisoners should be treated humanly, fairly, with dignity, with respect, and they should not be subjected to torture. No matter why these prisoners are inside the jails, no matter what the circumstances are, no circumstance can justify the treatment or cruelty against the prisoners. So they should not be subjected to torture. We also need to understand for the civil services examination that there is 1987 United Nations Convention Against Torture, which India has not still ratified. This can be a prelims based question in your examination which of the following treaties or conventions have not been ratified by the government of India. One such is 1987 United Nations Convention Against Torture. And India is amongst five countries of the world which have not ratified this 1987 United Nations Convention Against Torture. But Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi writes that if you want to celebrate democracy, now it's an important opportunity since a legal imprint has been given to Nelson Mandela rules by the Madras High Court, now it is the duty of the states, it is the duty of the center to ensure that we are implementing these Nelson Mandela rules so that all the prison manuals are amended, modified to provide dignity, to provide respect to those who are languishing inside the jails. That is what you need to understand from this column, a call to treat India's prisoners fairly and humanly, written by Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi. Let's look at another column, the footloose vote, written by former Chief Election Commissioner Dr. S.Y. Qureshi. Voting is an important duty. Although it is not a fundamental duty enshrined in the Constitution, under part 4 capital A of the Constitution, under article 51 capital A of the Constitution. Nevertheless, voting is an important duty. In fact, right to vote is a constitutional right. This question was previously asked in UPSC prelims as well. According to UPSC answer key, right to vote is a constitutional right guaranteed by article 326 of the Constitution. But because of some developments in the past few decades, it has led to a situation which we can call as de facto disenfranchisement. And what do we mean by this de facto disenfranchisement? I am going to tell you, but slightly later. There are migrants in India who migrate from different parts of the country to another different parts of the country in search of livelihood, job opportunities for marriage as well. According to 2011 census, there are close to 450 million migrants in India, which correspond to 37% of India's population. But somehow they are unable to cast their vote. They are unable to exercise their constitutional right to vote because of migration. But look at me carefully. There are migrants, for example, you are from Bihar, but you are migrating to Karnataka because of marriage or because of livelihood opportunities. You may be registered as a voter in Karnataka as well. You may also become the domicile of Karnataka if you meet certain requirements. Which means you may be allowed to vote in Karnataka as well. But there are these migrants who are not too involved in the local politics of Karnataka. 
they are still concerned about the politics of Bihar. They are still worried about the state of Bihar. But they cannot go out and exercise their right to vote when general election is conducted, when a legislative assembly election is conducted. This is where majority of these migrants, they are unable to exercise their right to vote. Although the law does not bar them, prohibit them from voting. But it has led to this de facto disenfranchisement. Which basically means these migrants are unable to exercise their right to vote. But we are particularly talking about those migrants whom we call short term migrants or seasonal migrants. According to a study conducted by Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TIS, it says that there are close to 250 million seasonal migrants or circular migrants in India. And majority of them belong to the Dalit community, the Adivasis, the extremely backward classes of citizens. Although representation of the People Act 1951, it has a provision that the date of polling is a paid holiday. No matter where you are working, you are provided paid holiday when it comes to the date of voting. That means no organization can force you to work on the date of polling because you have to participate in the festival of India's democracy, which is the election. But because of their job, their livelihood opportunities, it becomes difficult for them to leave their place of work, travel to their original state and exercise their right to vote. Now a beautiful suggestion has been made by Election Commission of India, the Technical Committee of Election Commission of India in association with two public sector undertakings. One is the Bharat Electronics Limited based out of Bengaluru. The other is Electronics Corporation of India which is based out of Hyderabad. These two public sector undertakings along with the Technical Committee of the Election Commission of India, they have designed a remote electronic voting machine which will enable these migrants that no matter where you are there you can exercise your right to vote even if the election is in your respective home state these remote electronic voting machines have been designed and these remote EVMs will cater to 72 constituencies at the same time how for example, you are from Uttar Pradesh, but you are working in Maharashtra. If there is a general election in Uttar Pradesh, even if you are in Maharashtra, those individuals from Uttar Pradesh who are now working in Maharashtra, they can vote in Maharashtra, but for the elections conducted in Uttar Pradesh through these remote electronic voting machines, which will have the provision to cater to close to 72 constituencies. A demo was planned by the Election Commission of India. Election Commission of India asked the representatives of all political parties to come. Let's have a discussion. Let's have a consensus so that we can implement this remote electronic voting machine so that the right to vote is guaranteed to every single individual of this country. But opposition political parties oppose this, saying first you have to restore our faith in the electoral system. First, you have to restore the faith in the electronic voting machine. Whether you agree with this or disagree, there are opposition political parties which doubt the capability of our existing EVMs. They say EVMs can be tampered with, EVMs can be hacked. Whether genuine concern or misplaced concern, that's not the point of discussion today. But the point is, opposition is against implementing this remote EVM saying first election commission of india should help restore our faith in the electoral system because there are allegations of the blatant misuse of model code of conduct as well the allegation is that the election commission is biased in favor of the ruling political party at the center but whether genuine concern or misplaced concern we don't know but the point is opposition is against this electronic voting machine which will empower the migrants to vote in their place of work without having to travel back to their home state. Dr. S.Y. Qureshi writes that we have made enough progress and for that the consensus of political parties is necessary because it was this consensus which led to the implementation of VVPAT 
voter verifiable paper audit trail. A consensus was achieved when 2010 another round of discussion was conducted by Election Commission of India with the representatives of various political parties and all the political parties through consensus agreed for the implementation of VVPAT system. And what is this VVPAT system? Electronic voting machine had one problem. And what was the problem? Lack of transparency. And what is this lack of transparency? When I entered the polling booth, I pressed the blue button on the electronic voting machine. I was not knowing whether this vote has been registered in favor of the political party of my choice or not. Whether my vote has been registered in favor of the candidate of my choice or not because there was lack of transparency. I was not knowing whether this vote has been correctly registered or not. Now after this meeting with various political parties, VVPAT system was introduced which for the first time was put to use in 2013 in Noxen constituency in Nagaland where this VVPAT is connected to an EVM. When you press the button on an electronic voting machine, a display will be shown which will mention the serial number of your vote the name of the candidate you voted for as well as the symbol of the political party which you voted for. This information will be displayed for 7 seconds. After that, this ballot paper, this display information will be cut and it will drop into the ballot box. This was one way of ensuring transparency in the use of electronic voting machine. And Dr. S.Y. Qureshi says similar consensus is required to implement this novel suggestion, a noble suggestion of ensuring that remote workers, migrants are allowed to vote at a remote location through this remote electronic voting machine. But for that consensus is necessary. That will restore people's faith in the electronic voting machines. Dr. S. Y. Qureshi writes that we have made a progress since 1951 till 2019 progress on two counts and listen to me carefully initially the voting age was 21 whoever is of the age of 21 or about is eligible to cast his or her vote this voting age was reduced to 18 in the year 1989 Shri Rajiv Gandhi was the Prime Minister but the point is first we have to enroll register those who are eligible to vote and then those who are registered as voters, they should be persuaded to come out in large numbers and vote. In the year 1951, when the first general election was conducted, Election Commission of India was successful in registering close to 17% of the eligible voters. 17% of the eligible voters were registered, out of which 45% turned out to vote in the general election. Now this number of those who are eligible to vote and they are registered as voters, this number has shot up to 91% in 2019 elections. And the voting percentage has shot up to 67%. This 67% could have been 77%, could have been 87%. But the migrants because of de facto disenfranchisement, these migrants unfortunately are not in a position to exercise their right to vote. So if this remote EVM is implemented, we may see that we will deepen democracy. We will deepen democracy by ensuring that every single individual is capable of voting in these elections. And for that we need consensus. And consensus of various political parties in restoring the faith in democracy. Few more things that are important for your examination. First, EVM. EVMs were used for the first time in a by-election to Paravarur constituency or Parur constituency in Kerala. The year was 1982. But listen to me carefully. When this EVM was used for the first time, in a by-election to Paravarur or Parur constituency in Kerala, it was declared null and void. Why? Because representation of the People Act 1951, 
which governs the conduct of elections in India, it explicitly talked about conducting elections through ballot papers. So a petition was filed by a candidate who lost the election in a by-election to Paravarur constituency. A petition was filed that since Representation of the People Act explicitly talks about conducting elections through ballot papers, why has the Election Commission of India used electronic voting machine? The court upheld this proposition and ultimately this election was declared null and void. It was only in the late 1980s that Representation of the People Act was amended to provide for elections through electronic voting machines as well. And in the 1990s and then 2000 onwards, electronic voting machines alone have been used for the conduct of elections in India, whether it is legislative assembly election or it is the Lok Sabha election. That's number one. Number two, as I told you, VVPAT, VVPAT was used for the first time in 2013 in Noxen constituency in Nagaland. But there is still one problem with EVM. And what is that problem? Listen to me carefully. Any voting system that we use must satisfy four important criteria, must meet four requirements. Any voting system, whether we use ballot papers or EVMs or for that matter any other system, it must meet four important criteria. Number one, accuracy. What is my intent? I want to vote for a candidate A. No matter which system I am using, whether EVM or ballot paper, when I exercise my right to vote, this system should be accurate. That means my vote should be registered indeed in favor of candidate A. It should not be registered in favor of candidate B or Z. Accuracy is important. Second, speed. Any voting system that we use should be capable of giving us good results, quick results. That means I go to a polling booth, there is a long line, long queue, a sea of people waiting to exercise their right to vote. I may be not inclined to be part of this queue to exercise my right to vote if I believe that this is going to take a lot of time. But since we use EVMs which are very quick, that means a system, voting system should be capable of delivering vote in quick time should be capable of delivering and giving us results in quick time as well. Third, it should be scalable. Any voting system that we use should be capable of catering to a massive population such as India, one of the world's most populous countries. Any voting system that we use must be scalable as well. That means our voting system should be capable of catering to a large population base. But the most important of all, anonymity. Secrecy of vote should never be violated. Because if I am voting for a candidate A or a political party A, and if some people get to know that I have voted for candidate A, and if candidate B got elected, maybe this candidate will victimize me. Maybe this candidate will not cater to my grievances and issues and resolve my problems because he will victimize me for voting for another candidate or another political party. Voting system must be able to ensure secrecy of vote and EVMs violate this secrecy. That is why we need a reform and what is that reform? I'm going to tell you now. But how does EVM violate the secrecy? For example, this is the constituency. There are, let's say, 10 polling booths in this constituency. When these polling booths, when the election is over and we have to count the votes, we count the votes polling booth by polling booth. That means we take one EVM, we now calculate, count the votes. And there are representatives of political parties who are watching this to ensure that the counting of vote is in order so that there is no manipulation there are representatives of political parties who are inside the counting room inside the counting hall who are monitoring this but the point is when you are monitoring this and you take up electronic voting machines polling booth by polling booth these representatives get to know which polling station 
which means which part of our constituency is voting for us which part of the constituency is voting for an opposition candidate or an opposition political party which may also lead to a possible victimization of that polling booth of that community that is why election commission of india since 2010 is recommending something known as a totalizer what is this totalizer for that we need to understand the ballot paper system which we were using before the advent of electronic voting machines before electronic voting machines when we were using ballot papers you come inside the polling booth you mark your preference on the ballot paper you drop the ballot paper in the ballot box now all these ballot boxes were taken together all the votes were mixed in a big drum and one by one the ballot papers were taken out and counted so nobody would get to know this vote comes from which part of the constituency now a totalizer will do a similar thing as done by this drum in a pre EVM era totalizer would be like an adder what it will do it will take for example 14 electronic voting machines together and will be fed to this totalizer and totalizer will give the final count a got these many votes b got these many votes without telling the political party without telling the candidate which part of the constituency voted for you which part of the constituency voted for an opposition candidate this is how secrecy of the vote will be safeguard secrecy of the vote will be enshrined but political parties they have been opposing the use of totalizers saying it will affect our booth management as a political party we should know which part of the constituency is in favor of us which part of the constituency is against us so that we can persuade them that you should vote for us so it will go against our booth management policies if totalizer is implemented but election commission of india law commission and various other experts and activists they have long been batting for the use of totalizers in electronic voting machines but this revolt evm it's a good reform but it raises three concerns or three issues one issue is legal what is the legal issue involved for which we need to amend a representation of the people act and what is that issue how do you define a migrant should it be interstate migrant or intrastate migrant in a sense who is allowed to access this remote electronic voting machine who is allowed to vote at a different location using these electronic voting machine is it somebody who has migrated from Bihar to Maharashtra or is it somebody who is still in Maharashtra who is from Maharashtra but he was from a different district of Maharashtra but is now residing and working and earning his livelihood in Mumbai so how do we define this migrant whether interstate migrant or intrastate migrant that is question number one that is issue number one that's a legal issue second is administrative issue what is the administrative issue involved for example there are elections in Bihar to Bihar legislative assembly but there are migrants from Bihar who are now working or studying in Karnataka and in Karnataka there is an area where there is a massive population of these migrants from Bihar in Bihar model code of conduct will be implemented because model code of conduct is implemented as soon as the election dates are announced by the election commission of India and this model code of conduct remains in place till the declaration of results but model code of conduct will be imposed only in Bihar will this model code of conduct be also imposed in an area which has a significant migration migrant population from Bihar but the state is Maharashtra or the state is Tamil Nadu or the state is Karnataka that's administrative question number two and third is another issue which deals with VV Pats, for example, the counting. Remote EVM, which is used in Maharashtra, but for the election to Bihar, 
will these remote EVMs be physically transported to Bihar for counting? And what will happen to these VVPAT slips? Will these also be transported back to Bihar for counting purpose? These are the three critical questions for which we need an answer from the Election Commission of India. But that could only happen once there is a consensus amongst all the political parties because this is a reform which is required. Because that is how we can deepen our democracy when every single eligible voter has an opportunity to exercise his right to vote or exercise her right to vote. And that is going to help further and deepen democracy in India. That is what you need to understand from this column. The Footloose Vote, written by former Chief Election Commissioner Dr. S.Y. Qureshi. Clear? Let's look at another column. Reality Check for Raj Bhavans. This column has been taken from the Indian Express. But we have covered this previously. In the first episode of Polity this week, we discussed something where Governor's Address which was prepared, the text was prepared by the cabinet of Tamil Nadu. But the governor of Tamil Nadu skipped some portions of this speech which was prepared by the cabinet. It has not happened for the first time. It is not going to happen for the last time. This has happened in the past. Whether it was legal or illegal, moral or immoral, constitutional or unconstitutional that we have discussed in episode 1 of Polity this week. But here some of the important judgments have been cited by the author. And I'm going to tell you very briefly the significance of all the four important judgments that are cited in this column which are very important for your civil services examination. The first judgment which has been often cited in various newspapers is Shamsher Singh versus State of Punjab. If you look at various columns editorials, articles written on the tussle between the governor and the government, particularly in the opposition rule states. This judgment is often referred to in the newspaper columns. But you should know what was this judgment all about. Shamshed Singh, he was a judge in a subordinate court in Punjab. Shamshed Singh was a judge in a subordinate court in Punjab, but he was on probation. Once the probation period is over, then you are regularized. But this judge, Shamsher Singh, he was removed from the service. Who removed him from the service? The government of Punjab. But the government of Punjab issued the removal order against Shamsher Singh in the name of governor. Why? Because all the executive powers are vested in the name of the governor. Any executive decision taken by the government has to be taken in the name of the governor. Now Shamsher Singh approached the court. The year was 1975 and said the government of Punjab should not have terminated me. It should have been the personal decision of the governor of Punjab. The court asked why. The petitioner said Look at article 311 of the constitution, which provides me a safeguard. The court asked, what is that safeguard? Shamshir Singh said, I cannot be removed from my service. I cannot be dismissed from the service. My rank cannot be reduced except by an authority which has appointed me. So if the governor has appointed me as the judge of a subordinate court, only the governor can remove me, dismiss me or reduce my rank. And the governor has to take his independent decision, personal decision. This can't be the decision of the government of Punjab. The court asked, how do you know about this? Shamshir Singh said, because this was the Supreme Court judgment in Sardari Lal case. Sardari Lal 1971, where the court had said, that it is the personal decision of the governor. It's the personal decision of the president, not on the advice of the council of ministers. But in this case, Shamsher Singh versus state of Punjab, the Supreme Court said, we follow a parliamentary form of democracy. 
and in a parliamentary form of democracy, although we have a constitutional head, but he is a nominal head, titular head, whether president at the central level or governor at the state level. The real power is with the prime minister and his council of ministers at the central level. The real power is with the chief minister and council of ministers at the state level. So president and the governor will have to take every decision only on the advice of the chief minister and council of ministers. Only on the advice of the government. And that is how Shamshed Singh was removed from the service. But listen to me carefully. It's my job as the teacher to also point out some inaccuracies that are there in the newspaper articles. This newspaper article is written by the spokesperson of the DMK. With due respect to this political party, but he is making some factual, factual error in this article. According to this article, he says the Supreme Court has said that there is no discretion available with the President and the Governor. They have to act only on the aid and advice of the government, of the Council of Ministers, headed by the Chief Minister, Council of Ministers, headed by the Prime Minister. But this is not correct. Why? Because Constitution says under Article 163 that there shall be Council of Ministers headed by the Chief Minister to aid and advise the Governor. Who shall act on that advice? Except when the Governor has to act in his discretion. And the Constitution further says if there is a dispute as to what constitutes the discretionary power of the governor, the word of the governor shall be final. That means the governor of the state gets to decide what are my discretionary powers. What are these discretionary powers? They have not been codified and explained in the constitution. So governor has a discretionary power. The president does not have a discretionary power. Governor wields influence as well as power. We say the president wields only influence. The president does not have the power. President has to do everything only on the advice of the prime minister and the council of ministers. But there is an element of discretion available with the governor. This is where we can link this topic with some of the developments which are taking place in other parts of the country. The vice president of India, the law and justice minister at the central level, they are criticizing the Supreme Court. On what grounds? One, on judicial appointments. Criticizing the collegium system of judicial appointments. Criticizing the doctrine of the basic structure. Criticizing the interference of the courts in various legislative matters. But the fault is not with the Supreme Court. The fault is with the other organs of the state. Which are not following the constitution which are violating the constitution. How? Listen to me carefully. This is where the second important case which has been cited in this article comes into picture. Nabam Rebia versus Deputy Speaker of Arunachal Pradesh Legislative Assembly. The year was 2016. Very briefly, what was this case all about? In Arunachal Pradesh, there was a government headed by Mr. Nabam Tuki, who was from the Congress party. But there was a revolt against Mr. Tuki by his MLAs who revolted against him. Now long story short, it's only on the advice of the Council of Ministers headed by the Chief Minister that the Governor can summon the Legislative Assembly. That's not the discretionary power of the Governor. But what does Constitution say? There shall be Council of Ministers with Chief Minister at its head to aid and advise the Governor who shall act on that advice except when the governor has to act in his discretion. According to the advice given by Council of Ministers to the governor, the session of the Legislative Assembly of Arunachal Pradesh had to be convened on 14th of January 2016. But the governor preponed this session and said instead of 14th January 2016, we will meet on 16th of December 2015. Matter went to the court. That is why I tell you, the fault is not with the court. The fault is with the other organs of the state which are not following the spirit of the constitution. And the court said, in this Nabam Rabia judgment, that convening the session of the legislature, 
summoning the legislature is not the discretionary power of the governor. The governor can summon the legislative assembly only on the aid and advice of the chief minister and his council of ministers. That's judgment number one. So one is Shamsher Singh versus State of Punjab, 1975. Second, Nabam Rabia versus Deputy Speaker of Arunachal Pradesh Legislative Assembly, 2016. The third judgment is that of Kesham Mega Chandra Singh versus Honorable Speaker, 2020. This was a curious case. There was a member of Manipur Legislative Assembly, Mr. T. Sham Kumar, who was elected on the Congress ticket. But he defected, joined the BJP and was appointed as a minister. He was appointed as forests minister in Manipur government. Matter went to the speaker. Speaker, you should disqualify Mr. T. Sham Kumar. He said, why? Because he has violated the 10th schedule of the constitution, the anti-defection law. The speaker is not acting. Matter went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is asking the speaker, please take a decision. Speaker is not taking a decision. The Supreme Court is telling the speaker that you have four weeks to decide on this disqualification petition. Four weeks are over. The speaker is yet to take a decision. The speaker is asking for more time. The court said enough is enough. Listen to me carefully. Two judges of the Supreme Court. One judge was Justice Rohintan Fali Nariman who has now criticized the law minister yesterday in one of his speeches he has criticized the law minister saying it's a diatribe he has launched a diatribe against the collegium the collegium should set up a fifth judges bench and should say that judicial appointments recommended by the collegium should be accepted by the government within 30 days that's what justice rohintan fali nariman is arguing but be that as it may in this judgment of 2020 the Supreme Court invoked its plenary power. Plenary power under Article 142 of the Constitution. Under Article 142, the Supreme Court can issue any order so as to give complete justice. And this power cannot be regulated by the executive. This power cannot be regulated by the legislature. This is a plenary power of the Supreme Court. Two judges of the Supreme Court they are saying that Mr. T. Sham Kumar, you cannot enter the Legislative Assembly of Manipur. Two judges of the Supreme Court are saying, needless to say, Mr. T. Sham Kumar, you are no longer a minister. Is this violation of separation of powers? On paper it is. Why? Because a minister is appointed by the governor on the advice of the chief minister. A minister can be removed by the governor on the advice of the chief minister. But this time it is the Supreme Court which is stopping a legislator from entering the Legislative Assembly. It is the Supreme Court which is using its plenary power under Article 142 to dismiss a minister. This is to give complete justice. And that is why I tell you, the problem is not with the court, where the court is interfering in the legislative area. The problem is when other constitutional organs are not following the spirit of the Constitution. And the fourth judgment cited here is A.G. Perarivalan versus State of Tamil Nadu, 2022. Here also, Article 142 was invoked by the Supreme Court. Perarivalan was an accused, a convict in Rajiv Gandhi assassination case, spent close to three decades in jail. The government of Tamil Nadu, the cabinet of Tamil Nadu had recommended to the governor of Tamil Nadu that you should release Perarivalan. The governor is sitting on this advice and is referring this matter to the president of India. The Supreme Court is saying bills can be referred by the governor for the consideration of the president. But this is an advice under Article 161, pardoning powers of the governor. The governor has to discharge his constitutional duty of pardon only on the advice of the chief minister and his council of ministers. So when the cabinet has recommended that you should release Perarivalan, you are not releasing him. You are sitting on the matter. You are reserving this matter for the consideration of the president. The Supreme Court said enough is enough. We are invoking Article 142 because Mr. Perarivalan has spent long years in jail 
He was incarcerated for a long time. His conduct in the jail has been good. He has also read a lot inside the jail and has also indulged in various educational opportunities because of his conduct, because of him spending a large part of his time in the jail. Mr. Pirari Valan is a free man at liberty invoking Article 142 of the Constitution. So on this tussle between the governor and the chief ministers, we have read a lot. The first episode of Polity this week, we covered this. We have covered this in the daily newspaper analysis as well. But there are four important judgments which are cited in this column in Indian Express, which talk about federalism, which talk about Supreme Court getting involved in administrative matters, Supreme Court getting involved in the legislative matters. And you should know these four important judgments. Shamsher Singh versus State of Punjab, Nabam Rabia, 2016. Similarly, the T. Sham Kumar case of the Manipur Legislative Assembly, 2020, and then 2022 A.G. Pirari Valan case. These are the four cases that you must know for the civil services examination. And that is all that you need to know regarding this column, reality check for Raj Bhavans. Clear? Let's look at another column. India's juggernaut of censorship. Two things have happened. Number one, a documentary by the BBC against Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, called the Modi Question. The government invoked powers under IT rules, invoked powers under Section 69 Capital A of Information Technology Act 2000. These are basically emergency powers. The government used these emergency powers to direct Twitter, YouTube to take down this documentary and prevent the re-upload of this documentary invoking the emergency powers. That's number one. Number two, the government, the central government, Ministry of Information Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, it had to release some rules, some draft rules for regulating online gambling or online gaming. But while releasing these draft rules, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology released another set of rules. These rules basically called upon public that if you want, you can give your suggestions to this draft. We have a draft how to regulate the online gaming or gambling. We have a draft how to protect or tackle something known as fake news. Both these issues dominated the newspaper articles in the past week. And let's look at both these issues one by one, but very carefully. First, you need to understand that there is a fundamental right available to every citizen of India. This is a fundamental right which is not available to foreigners. This is a fundamental right which is exclusively available to the citizens of India. And it is known as freedom of speech and expression under Article 19 1A of the Constitution. Say whatever you have to say, express whatever you have to express, that is your freedom of speech and expression, free speech. But it is not an absolute fundamental right. It does not mean that you can say whatever you want to say, you can publish whatever you want to publish. There are reasonable restrictions imposed on your free speech by the constitution itself under Article 19, Clause 2 of the Constitution. What are these reasonable restrictions? On eight grounds, your freedom of speech and expression can be restricted. In the interest of sovereignty and integrity of India, in the interest of security of state, in the interest of friendly relations with foreign states, in the interest of public order, for defamation, contempt of court, morality or decency, incitement to an offence. There are eight reasonable restrictions on your freedom of speech and expression. Clear? 
freedom of press is not explicitly mentioned in the constitution freedom of press is explicitly mentioned in the US constitution but not in India but the Supreme Court has said freedom of press is also a fundamental right under article 19 1a of the constitution freedom to publish by the print media freedom to broadcast by the electronic news channels that's the fundamental right under article 19 1a of the constitution another important judgment cricket association of bengal case the supreme court said free speech means freedom to disseminate information freedom to transmit information and freedom to receive information is also part of the free speech protected by article 19 1a of the constitution these are the things that you should know we are going step by step one freedom of speech and expression which is a fundamental right under the constitution but it is not an absolute fundamental right there are eight reasonable restrictions under which your freedom of speech and expression can be restricted number one number two free speech means freedom of press as well number three freedom of press means freedom to transmit information freedom to impart information as well according to Chris, uh, cricket association of bengal case but what has happened it rules 2021 and section 69 capital a of information technology act 2000 these are basically emergency powers whenever there is an emergency under section 69 capital a of information technology act 2000 the central government may direct an intermediary that you have to take down content from your website for example tiktok and various chinese apps were blocked in india banned in india invoking section 69 capital a of information technology act any content which is detrimental to the sovereignty and integrity of india any website or an app or a youtube channel because some of the pakistani youtube channels which were spreading disinformation in india they were also stopped invoking these emergency powers so whenever there is a threat to sovereignty and integrity of india the central government may direct that an intermediary whether it is facebook or twitter or youtube may block content by invoking these emergency powers one set of people are saying this documentary by the bbc called the modi question the government authorities say that this documentary is a propaganda reflects a colonial mindset even if for the sake of argument we agree that yes it is propaganda yes it reflects colonial mindset but what is the emergency in taking this documentary down or blocking access to this documentary if indeed there are some things which are defamatory in this document in this documentary mr modi could have sued filed a defamation suit against the bbc but there is one argument which says that you can't be using these emergency powers because this emergency power has not been legally defined you can't be invoking these emergency powers to stop the broadcast of a documentary to pull it down and prevent the re-upload of this documentary that's number one number two when this draft rule listen to me carefully when this draft rule were issued put out on the website of the ministry of electronics and information technology to self-regulate online gambling or gaming but gambling is a state subject in the distribution of powers it comes under the state list so why is central government interfering in a subject which is within the legitimate domain of the states that's issue number one because it raises a question on federalism number two even if the draft rules were to be issued to regulate online gaming or gambling what was the need to bring in draft rules on fake news 
because the ministry invited suggestions from the people and other individuals what are your suggestions because we need to tackle fake news as well and the ministry of information ministry of electronics and information technology says that PIB which is a government body or any other body authorized by the government can declare a content as fake and this content will have to be taken down by an intermediary without any opportunity without any recourse without any challenge what does that mean I'll repeat draft guidelines to regulate online gaming were released by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology along with these guidelines were also released draft guidelines to tackle the menace of fake news although it had no relation with online gaming although online gambling or gambling as a subject is within the legitimate domain of the states so it raises a fundamental question on central government encroaching upon the legitimate domain of the state which is part of the state list but be that as it may these rules say any content which PIB's team fact check team PIB has a fact check team which looks at the content on OTT platforms or on websites Twitter Facebook YouTube and it will have the power to recommend to the intermediaries to Facebook Twitter YouTube that you have to block this content take down this content without giving opportunity to the author to the publisher why we are taking down your content this critic say amounts to censorship how censorship this critic say brings us back to section 66 a of IT Act what is that section 66 capital A of IT Act it was declared unconstitutional by the judiciary in Shreya Singhal versus Union of India 2015 section 66 capital A it was part of the information technology act 2000 it was added to this law in the year 2008 and it is argued that this section was added to this law without any debate in the parliament but that's a separate matter altogether what was the section 66 capital A if you use an electronic device it can be smartphone it can be laptop it can be desktop and if you transmit messages which cause annoyance to somebody you can be arrested one lady Shaheen Darda Shiv Sena Supremo Shri Bal Thakre passed away a band was organized by the members of the Shiv Sena and Shaheen Darda is posting on her Facebook what is the need to organize a band in the memory of Mr. Bal Thakre one of her friend liked her status both were arrested because if you use an electronic device to transmit a message which causes annoyance to somebody you are a criminal under section 66 capital A another businessman from Puducherry he tweeted wrote on his Twitter account that Mr. Karthi Chidambaram the son of the then finance minister Mr. P. Chidambaram has amassed wealth which is disproportionate to his known source of income this caused annoyance to the honorable member and ultimately this businessman from Puducherry was also arrested Shreya Singhal was a law student she approached the Supreme Court saying this is a violative of article 191a of the Constitution which guarantees free speech as a fundamental right to the citizens of India Supreme Court said yes section 66 capital A is unconstitutional because it it has a chilling effect on free speech Supreme Court said something important an error of fact listen to me carefully an error of fact is not a reasonable restriction on what grounds can your freedom of speech and expression be restricted in the interest of sovereignty and integrity of India security of state friendly relations with foreign countries public order defamation incitement to an offense morality or decency 
what if there is a tweet which is fake what if there is a tweet which has error what if there is a post which has an error an error of fact cannot be a reasonable restriction under which your freedom of speech and expression can be restricted so how can PIB which is a government body can regulate and dictate to a social media intermediary that you have to block this tweet or a YouTube video or a Facebook post because it is fake how can government decide what is fake because it amounts to censorship something else and listen to me carefully look at how deep you have to go into it the government says the draft says these rules do not apply to print media and electronics media clear because print media is self-regulated there is a press council of India which regulates print media these rules do not apply to electronic news channels why because they're also self-regulated by the National Broadcasters Association clear but these news channels for example NDTV Republic TV they also have their social media handles Twitter account Facebook account the Hindu Hindustan Times Indian Express they also have their social media accounts so these rules will apply to these OTTs or social media accounts of print media and electronic media so how can PIB regulate them when the government does not have the power to regulate them that's the power with the self-regulatory bodies such as the press council of India and the national broadcasting standards authority that's number one number two when PIB has a fact check team initially it used to label content as fake for example there is a tweet or there's a Facebook post PIB press information bureau has a fact check team which would label a tweet or a Facebook post as fake so that telling the people that you should not trust this tweet because it has been labeled as fake now it has been given the power to pull down this content without giving opportunity to the publisher why we are taking your content down and the track record of this fact check team of the PIB is also not encouraging why June 2020 listen to me carefully June 2020 the UP special task force releases a list of Chinese apps telling its personnel not to download these apps for security reasons June 2020 UP special task force is releasing a list of Chinese apps telling its personnel not to download these apps for security reasons PIB's fact check team says this is fake but the reality was this was not fake this was a real notification given by UP special task force instance number one instance number two intelligence bureau released a recruitment notification that we are released advertising these jobs these posts PIB's fact check team says this notification is fake while in reality the very next day the intelligence bureau said no it is not fake we have genuinely released this recruitment notification but if you label content as fake tomorrow you can go back on this and remove that label but what if this content has been taken down so that is the problem and that is why Indian Express also released an editorial saying the government should not do what it cannot do it cannot act as a censor and using these draft rules if these rules are really implemented where PIB's fact check team can direct a social media intermediary to take down the content if this rule is indeed implemented it will make the government a censor which constitutionally and based on the judgments of the Supreme Court and Shia single case cannot assume the role of a censor luckily the government the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology it has extended the deadline asking giving more time to people to recommend suggestions to these drafts let's see what the government has to do on this matter whether these rules will be implemented or these rules will be shelved then we will have a elaborate discussion on this 
but that is what you need to know regarding India's juggernaut of censorship. Clear? Let's look at another important column taken from Economic and Political Weekly. What purpose will foreign universities serve? UGC released a set of regulations known as University Grants Commission setting up an operation of campuses of foreign higher educational institutions in India regulations 2023 asking the suggestions from the people this draft regulation was set up was put out on the UGC website asking the suggestions of the people how can we better implement these regulations according to these regulations foreign universities top 500 foreign universities according to global rankings they can come and set up campuses in India and they will have the full autonomy to operate in India in a sense what should be the admission criteria of Indian students and foreign students in these foreign campuses that you decide what should be the eligibility criteria of the teachers faculty how do you train them how do you recruit them your call what should be the fee structure what should be the academic standard that you decide but the only thing is you cannot give online classes you cannot give distance learning programs you cannot offer distance learning programs and if for example Ox University of Cambridge is establishing a foreign campus in India University of Cambridge should give equal acceptance to the certificates that means the certificate given by University of Cambridge Cambridge in India should have the same reputation same credibility as the certificate issued by the University of Cambridge in London it should have the same reputation same credibility now there are some sections of the society which welcome this move and there are some sections of the society which oppose this move let's look at the arguments in favor of admitting these foreign universities in India number one this is to implement new national education policy the new national education policy it said that we will take steps we will have a legislative framework to allow top 100 foreign universities to come to India and establish campuses in India but these drafts this draft regulation it says we will allow 500 top universities of different parts of the world to come to India and establish campuses even if you are not amongst the top 500 but in your country you are a university of repute you are an institution of a reputed character we will allow you to establish a campus in India and you will have the full functional autonomy to decide how to run your institution in fact some of the profit that you can obtain by operating in India you can transfer some of this profit back to your original university back to your country of origin which means if a university X operates its foreign campus in India some of the profits released by this foreign campus in India can be repatriated back to this country of origin that's how full functional autonomy will be given to these foreign universities the idea is number one to implement the new national education policy number two if foreign universities enter India what will happen it will have an impact on Indian universities they will also decide and they will also take steps to reform themselves increase and enhance their own quality of education otherwise they will fear missing out otherwise they will fear that Indian students will enroll in these foreign campuses and we will be left with nothing so competition will increase Indian universities will start improving their academic performance will start improving the quality of education it's a win-win situation for the students of India that's number two number three it is to ensure that we regain our lost ground India was home to one of the world's most important top 
world-class universities in ancient India. Nalanda University, Takshashila University, Vikramshila University, where students from China and various other countries would come and study in India. So this is another step wherein foreign universities will come to India, establish campuses in India, so we can attract students from various other countries and they will study in India. Which means they will bring dollars to India. It's a win-win situation for Indian economy. And it will also prevent some outward remittances. Indian students studying abroad. And this was reflective in when the Ukraine war broke out. When thousands of medical students from India who were studying in Ukraine, they had to come back. And we realized, oh my God, what are we doing? Hundreds and thousands of our students, they are studying in Ukraine and in other parts of the world because in India, there are lesser number of institutions guaranteeing medical education. And in fact, these medical institutions in India, they are costly as well. So you go out of your country to Ukraine and in other parts of the world because their prima facie, the education, medical education primarily is cheaper than in India. Now, if foreign campuses, foreign institutions are allowed to set up campuses in India, some outward remittances can be reduced. Because these students who are studying abroad, their parents would send them money back to their country. And this outward remittances will see a drop if foreign universities are allowed to set up campuses in India. But there are others who criticize it. Particularly, somebody like Professor Pratap Banu Mehta. Why? Dr. Pratap Banu Mehta writes in the Indian Express. He says there are top universities such as Princeton, such as Oxford, such as Yale, such as Stanford. They do not have foreign campuses anywhere in the world. Not even in those countries where they are given full autonomy or where they may be given full autonomy. So why would these foreign universities of repute, top tier universities, come to India, establish campuses in India where we have University Grants Commission, which is a regulator. Pratap Banu Mehta argues that there are close to 400 foreign campuses of universities in different parts of the world. A university may be in London but setting up foreign campuses in Australia or in Bahrain in other parts of the world. There are 400 such campuses in the world but majority of them are mediocre institutions. They do not belong to top tier institution. The only exception according to Dr. Pratap Banu Mehta is NYU Abu Dhabi which is a world-class institution, a foreign campus of New York University in Abu Dhabi. This is the only exception according to Dr. Pratap Banu Mehta, which is an institution of repute. All other, majority of these 400 foreign campuses, they are not part of top-tier institutions. So why would top-tier institutions come to India and set up foreign campuses in India? That's number one. Number two, even out of these 400 foreign campuses, which are operating in different parts of the world. The home government gives subsidies to these foreign universities to operate in their country. For example, there is Dubai, UAE, which is inviting an American university to set up campus in Abu Dhabi. The home government, the UAE government subsidizes this university and that is how this foreign university can come and operate in Abu Dhabi. Dr. Pratap Banu Mehta asks, does that mean that to attract these foreign campuses in India, foreign universities in India, Indian government will subsidize them? Then how would you justify spending taxpayers money, your money, my money in subsidizing foreign universities in India? That's problem number two. Problem number three, when you are saying that a foreign university can establish a campus in India 
and it can repatriate some of the money back to its original country which means you are a loving only those institutions to come to India whose primary objective is not imparting education but money minting whose primary intention is to make profit and give this profit back to its original country running a university is a wholesome different game it involves spending in teaching spending in research spending in infrastructure but if you're allowing a foreign university to establish a foreign campus in India and repatriate some of the profit that you generate here back to its original country which means this university will not invest in training infrastructure in research and development but will be primarily interest primarily interested in profit making Pratap Banu Mehta argues that there are wealthy Indians who have the potential of establishing world-class universities in India but they are not establishing universities in India why because they fear University Grants Commission because University Grants Commission does not give them autonomy University Grants Commission does not give them autonomy to decide their syllabus to decide their recruitment to decide their admission criteria to decide what courses they should be teaching University Grants Commission although is a regulator but it is squeezing and violating the autonomy of Indian universities so Indians wealthy Indians they have the potential they have the wherewithal of establishing a good reputed institution in India but they are not doing that because they fear University Grants Commission why will a foreign university establish campus in India when we have a University Grants Commission and Pratap Banu Mehta argues that even if UGC says we will give you functional autonomy to operate in India why don't you give this functional autonomy to public institutions in India to government institutions in India to private institutions in India is it not hypocrisy that you are giving freedom to foreign universities but you are restricting the Indian universities freedom for, for foreign institutions chains for Indian universities this is hypocrisy according to Dr. Pratap Banu Mehta and he also argues that one thing we have to commend UGC for is that UGC is now accepting that previously we thought that private universities will solve the problem of education in India now we have given up on private universities as well now we are saying neither the public universities not the private universities foreign universities operating in India will solve the questions and problems of education in India for that UGC deserves credit but UGC believes that education is like a McDonald's franchisee which can be replicated every here and there this is not UGC this is University Gimmicks Commission but at the same time economic and political weekly is raising another important issue the issue of Indians in tertiary education tertiary education in the sense Indians who are enrolled in universities or in vocational training or in certificate diploma programs if you look at the age group of people in the age group of 25 to 34 years these people their enrollment in tertiary education what is the percentage of Indians in the age group of 25 to 34 who have been enrolled in tertiary education who are part of tertiary education for example universities this number is poor at 21% 21% of Indians in the age group of 25 to 34 they are enrolled in tertiary education this percentage for South Korea is 69% this percentage for Canada is 66% this percentage for Japan is 65% this percentage for France France is 50% so what we need to do we need to ensure that our attention is focusing on bringing these Indians into tertiary education not only doubling this number but trebling this number so that we can match South Korea we can match Japan 
And that is how we can become a knowledge economy. How many foreign students are studying in Indian universities? Do you know the number? The number of foreigners studying in Indian university, that number is 49,000. This number is close to 70,000 in Saudi Arabia. This number is close to a million in United States. This number is close to half a million in United Kingdom. So we are able to attract only 49,000 of foreign students to study in Indian universities. Opening Indian education system to foreign universities will not solve the problem according to Economic and Political Weekly. What we need to do, we need to invest heavily so that we can not only double but treble the enrollment of Indians in tertiary education. Because even if foreign universities come to India, these foreign universities will be elusive and elitist. And at the same time, these will be mediocre institutions. Even if foreign institutions are allowed to establish campuses in India, but they will cater to the rich, affluent sections of the society. They will be elusive, elitist, catering only to the elite sections of the society. But at the same time, these will not be from tier one institutions, but these will be mediocre institutions. That means we need to invest heavily, give autonomy to our Indian universities, give autonomy to Indian private institutions, encourage private wealthy individuals to establish campuses in India, to set up universities in India. Give them autonomy so that our enrollment ratio increases. That's how we can become a knowledge economy. That is what you need to understand from this column. What purpose will foreign universities serve? And EPW says only an inclusive approach in higher education sector can facilitate the transition to a knowledge economy. These were the five topics that we had to discuss today. Now let's take a look at some of the questions for practice questions for prelims examination. MCQs. Consider the following statements regarding the Committee on Subordinate Legislation. Why this question has been asked, I'll tell you slightly later in a section known as Watch Out. For example, there is a law. Let's say Citizenship Amendment Act. To implement this law, rules are to be made. Law is passed by the parliament, legislature. Rules are issued by the executive. Once the rules are made by the executive, there is a parliamentary oversight. There is a legislative oversight. This oversight is done by Committee on Subordinate Legislation. To ensure that if parliament gave power to the executive to make rules, whether the executive has followed this policy violating the constitution or violating the law passed by the parliament, whether this power has been exercised rightly or wrongly, whether there are some rules which are made by the executive which impose taxes, whether there are some rules which are made by the executive which talk about withdrawal of money from Consolidated Fund of India or withdrawal of money from public funds, whether there are some rules made by the executive which prohibit the jurisdiction of the courts because judicial review is part of the basic structure of the constitution. Neither the parliamentary law nor the rules by the executive can violate this basic structure which is judicial review. Long story short, there is a committee on subordinate legislation which is present in Lok Sabha as well as Rajya Sabha. In both Lok Sabha as well as Rajya Sabha, there are 15 members. The speaker of Lok Sabha nominates these members. The chairperson of Rajya Sabha nominates these members. No minister can be a member of this committee. And the term of this committee, term of the member is one year. And the principal purpose of this committee on subordinate legislation is to review the rules which are made by the executive. Rules to implement the laws. Let's look at the question. The committee exists in Lok Sabha only. Incorrect. 
because this committee exists in Rajya Sabha also. The committee was first constituted in December 1953, correct? The committee consists of not more than 15 members, correct? Who shall be elected by the members of Lok Sabha. Yes, 15 member committee is committee on subordinate legislation, but these members are not elected. These are nominated by the speaker. So which of the above statements is or are correct? Only one statement is correct. A is the right answer. Why this question has been asked? I'll tell you slightly later. Question number two. Consider the following statements. While EVMs do not require electricity, the VVPAT requires electricity for its operation. Neither the EVM nor the VVPAT requires electricity. They work on batteries. Incorrect. A totalizer machine was used for the first time in 2019 general elections. We've discussed this. There is a pushback by political parties against the implementation of totalizer machine because they believe it goes against the booth management policies of a political party. Which of the statements given above are correct? D. Both these statements are incorrect. None of the statements are correct. Let's look at two questions, practice questions for your mains examination. Number one, the minuscule share of foreign students in tertiary education in India is a pointer to the lackadaisical quality of the higher education sector in the country. Comment in 250 words. Question number two, misinformation and disinformation are serious threats in modern democratic societies. Suggest suitable measures to overcome such threats. So one question has been picked from the UGC draft regulation allowing foreign universities to establish campuses in India and the second is related to the menace of fake news. Let's look at another column. Last segment, watch out, which you have appreciated based on the comments that I read uh, from the previous, the first episode of Polity this week. There's a continued tussle between executive and judiciary on judicial appointments, on collegium system, on the doctrine of basic structure. So you'll have to watch out on this. But something serious happened recently. You would know that once collegium recommends name to the executive, it's binding on the executive to appoint that individual as the judge of a Supreme Court or High Court. But the executive can send the recommendation back. But raise objections in the writing. So if a collegium has recommended me to the Supreme Court or High Court, the executive is bound to appoint me. But the executive can raise objections. Send my name back. But raise objections in writing. We never found out why some people's, why some names were rejected by the government, some names were not reiterated by the collegium, we never knew. But for the first time, the Supreme Court has revealed the objections of the executive when names were recommended by the Supreme Court collegium. This has happened for the first time. And this is why the Law and Justice Minister, Mr. Kiran Rijiji, has said this is, this is a serious lapse on part of the judiciary to reveal the objections raised by the executive. What are these objections? Number one are John Sethian, an advocate of Madras High Court, was recommended by the Supreme Court Collegium as the judge of the Madras High Court. This name was sent back by the executive to the judiciary. But this time the judiciary revealed, the Collegium revealed the objections of the government. The government had objected that Mr. R. John Sethian, he had shared an article which was published on the Quint website. This article was critical of Prime Minister Modi. And that is why Intelligence Bureau had raised a red flag. And that is why we don't consider him suitable to be appointed as the judge of the Madras High Court. In another tweet, Mr. Sethian had tweeted when a girl from Tamil Nadu, she had committed suicide because she failed to qualify NEET examination. 
and a critical tweet was made out, tweeted by this lawyer. And these were the two objections raised by Intelligence Bureau. Now the Supreme Court Collegium is saying, just because you have tweeted a critical article against Prime Minister does not make you unsuitable for the judge of his Madras High Court. So now the Supreme Court Collegium has again reiterated his name to be appointed as the judge of the Madras High Court. Whether he will be accepted by the government or not, watch out. Second, Mr. Saurabh Kirpal, an advocate of Delhi High Court, recommended as the judge of the Delhi High Court. Research and analysis wing has raised objections. How do we know that? Because Supreme Court has revealed the objections of the government. Raw says, which is the external intelligence agency, research and analysis wing, it has said that this gentleman is openly gay. He has made no bones about his sexual orientation and his partner is a Swiss national. These were the two objections. That is why we do not consider him fit to be appointed as the judge of the Delhi High Court. The Supreme Court Collegium has reiterated his name, recommended his name again, saying right to love is a fundamental right. Homosexuality has been decriminalized based on Naute Johar judgment. And Switzerland is a friendly country. Just because your partner is a Swiss national, that does not make you unfit to be appointed as the judge of a Delhi High Court. We are again reiterating his name, appoint him. Whether he will be appointed or not, watch out. Somashekar Sundaresan, objection by the Ministry of Justice is that he is a highly opinionated person. He is extremely and selectively critical of the various policies, programs and regulations of the central government. That makes him unsuitable to be appointed as the judge of the Bombay High Court. The Supreme Court Collegium reiterated his name, saying being opinionated is not a crime. Whether he will be appointed by the government or not, watch out. So watch out for this continued tussle, conflict between the executive and the judiciary on judicial appointments. Number two, Hijab Rao. Last year, the state of Karnataka released rules saying hijab, which is a veil worn by Muslim women, cannot be worn by the students in government colleges, in PU colleges in Karnataka. Matter went to the Karnataka High Court. Karnataka High Court upheld the ban on hijab by the girl students in public universities, in public colleges saying that hijab is not part of the essential religious practice of Islam. When it is not an essential religious practice, it can be regulated. Matter went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court gave a split verdict. One judge was in favor of this ban. The other judge was against this ban. The judge who was against this ban said, for us, the primary objective is to ensure education of a girl child. If we stop these girl children from wearing hijab, their family members will force them to quit education, which cannot be allowed. So when there is a split verdict by the Supreme Court, one judge in favor, one judge against, the Supreme Court had to set up a three-judge bench to see whether this ban is constitutional or unconstitutional. But now these girls have approached the court, saying, my Lord, there are, there are exams planned. And these exams will be conducted in government institutions. According to various reports, in coastal Karnataka, when there was a ban on the wearing of hijab by the Muslim girls, a large section of these girls, they have come out of government institutions, opted for a seat in private educational institutions, where there is no ban on the wearing of hijab, which means that these students they have come out of the government education, opted for private education, but the exam will still be conducted in government institutions. So they fear that they will not be allowed to take the exams wearing the hijab. And the Supreme Court Chief Justice, Justice Chandrachur, has promised that we will hear, we will set up a three-judge bench to hear this case on an urgent basis. So watch out what the Supreme Court will have to rule on the hijab row. 
And the third, CAA rules extension. And that is why the question was asked on the Committee on Subordinate Legislation. 2019, a law was passed by the Parliament called Citizenship Amendment Act, which was basically amendment to the Indian Citizenship Act of 1955. According to the CAA of 2019, if you are from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, but you belong to Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, Parsi, Sikhs, and you have entered India on or before 31st December 2014, you will not be deemed as a legal migrant, which means you are eligible for citizenship through naturalization. But to implement this law, rules are to be made. According to the established convention, rules are to be made by the executive within six months of the president's assent. So when the president gave his assent to CAA in 2019, within six months, executive had to come up with rules. If not, you have to seek extension from the Committee on Subordinate Legislation. The government said because of COVID, we could not make these rules. The government sought extension, sought extension from the, cab from the Committee on Subordinate Legislation. Not once, not twice, not thrice, not four times. Seventh extension has now been given to the central government to make rules for the implementation of the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. So watch out for the rules which will be made by the executive to implement CAA 2019. These are the five topics, two MCQs, two mains based questions and three watch outs that we had to discuss today in this hopefully fascinating session of the second episode of Polity this week. See you again next Saturday with another interesting discussion on the important current affairs topics from the world of polity. Till then, have a great time ahead. Good night. Stay safe.